please stand by. We'll be streaming live soon. Morning, everyone. Let me get my thing adjusted here. There. That's a little better. I can see it. Um, today we're going to look at Mark chapter 11. This is going to. This chapter is going to take a couple of sessions to go through because there's a lot of offshoots on it. So we want to start out. Um, uh, I'll be talking from the. Um, uh, modern English version today, and um, let's start with Mark 11, chapter one or chapter 11, verse one. When they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, "Go into the village opposite you. As soon as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it, bring it here, and if anyone says to you," Why are you doing this? The Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. They went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside in the street. And they untied it. Some of those who stood there said to them, Why are you untying this colt? They answered just as Jesus had commanded them. And they let them go. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw our garments on it. And he sat upon it. Many spread their garments on the street, and others cut down branches of the trees and scattered them on the street. Those who went out before and those who followed cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of our father David that is coming in the name of the Lord. Hosanna! And the highest. And Jesus entered Jerusalem. And went into the temple, and when he looked around at everything, as the hour was now late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now, one of the more interesting things about this particular passage, and, and I just, it's marvels to me, uh, Jesus gets words. He, the Lord speaks to him and tells him what happens. Jesus says, down to the, to the exact thing that the guy would say, there's going to be a cult there, go get it. Uh, take it, somebody will ask you what to do with it, you tell them to do this and they'll let them go. And that's exactly what happened. Um, this is why it's so important for us, and as later on we'll, we'll look at this, is how important it is to actually hear what Jesus says. You have to hear what he says in order to be able to do what he wants you to do. Um, clarifying his words, uh, you can go to John 10, and says that uh, my sheep hear my voice and the voice of a stranger they will not follow. So in this case, we know that Jesus is listening to the Lord, and the Lord gave him these words, and he acted upon them, and, and, and um, it happened just exactly as he said. Now, the next day is the, where things get interesting here to me. On the next day, when they had returned from Bethany, which is not far from Jerusalem, kind of a bedroom community, I would assume, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree with leaves, he went to see if perhaps he might find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing except leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And Jesus said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Now, let's look at this real carefully. I want you to count this. May no one ever eat fruit from you again. Those are nine words. That's all Jesus said. He said nine words and then turned around and walked off. Now, the interesting part about this is when he goes there, he's expecting to see figs, and the, and the scriptures say that it wasn't the time for figs. It's my understanding from an agronomic standpoint that figs sometimes... some. Trees will, will, will produce fruit at different times. And maybe one tree will produce, maybe it's like a male, female. I haven't studied it well enough to know, but it, I understand that he's not, he's not asking the tree to do something that it's not supposed to be doing. He just didn't, this is just one tree that's not producing fruit at that time. So, he says, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. Now, 
interesting thing about this is 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13 uh, says that we believe, therefore we speak. And there's, a, there's, an old, uh, there, there's an old acrostic that I use, BSA. It's not a motorcycle. <laughs> it's not an old motorcycle company. BSA means believe, speak, and act. And this is what we do all the time, no matter whether it's for the good or for the bad. We believe something, we speak about it, then we act on it. Okay? We believe, speak, and act. Now, what Jesus is doing here, he believes that this tree is not going to produce any more fruit. He speaks it, and then he acts on it, he just leaves it alone. He doesn't say anything else to it again. And we'll see in just a second when, when Peter catches him in it, after the cleansing of the temple... We go back to Mark chapter 5, and you'll find a guy named Jairus. We talked about him earlier and his daughter. Uh, he said to Jesus, if you'll come lay your hands on my daughter, she will live. That's all he says. The death messenger shows up and says, hey, look, your daughter's dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? And we don't ever hear uh, Jairus say another thing. He spoke what he believed. That was his words of faith. And he never backed off of them. He never contradicted them. He never spoke against it. Well, I guess maybe it didn't work this time. You know, he just spoke what he believed. Jesus said, I'll come do it. And when the death messenger showed up, Jesus said, don't be alarmed, seized with alarm and struck by fear. Just believe. Well, in this case, Jesus only says nine words, and that's it. Now, just park that in your garage for a second. Now, let's go down to verse 15. They came to Jerusalem, Jesus went into the temple, and began to drive out those who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught them and said, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. The scribes and the priests heard it and looked for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, he went out of the city. Now, the chief priests and the scribes heard it, and they were looking for a way to kill him. This is, goes back to the basic principle that Jesus taught in Mark 4. The sower sows the word, and these are they when they hear it. Satan comes immediately to steal the word which is sown. And we know again in John 10.10, 10, a quick description of the thief is, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So in this case, we can see that Satan is beginning to work here. And it says they feared him. Now the word fear is the Greek word phobos. Phobos. And it means exactly what it is, where we get our word fear from, like, your acrophobia or, you know, fear of heights, fear of spiders, fear of this, fear of that. That's the base word, fear. They were afraid of Jesus. There's no doubt about it. Now, when evening came, he went out of the city. Now, uh, there is a, I just got a footnote out here, and we, we maybe we go through this sometime soon. Go tell that fox. Uh, you can find that on, the, on YouTube with John... Ortberg, and I suggest highly that you go get it and read it or listen to it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Jesus was not afraid to confront the powers that be. And in this case right here, he was confronting the powers that be. And they didn't like it, but they didn't know what to do about it. They hated him for it, and they wanted to kill him. So the parable of the sower is working exactly as Jesus said it would. He puts out the word. Satan comes immediately to try to steal the word whether it's by shutting him down or shutting the people down or whatever. So we see the parable of the sower weaves its way throughout the scriptures, and especially in the New Testament. You can see it's it, the, the, the background. You can see it as a foundation of a lot of the things that go on in the New Testament. Now, let's get into verse 20, and let's look about the lesson from the fig tree. And here's where we're going to get into some really interesting things. Verse 20, in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter, calling to remembrance, said to him, Hey, Rabbi, 
Look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. In other words, those nine words that you spoke have done a number on this tree. We, we want to know how did that happen. Okay, So Jesus is going to explain to them how it worked. Now, this is where we may get out of the uh, book of Acts uh, for a couple of sessions as we've tracked this down, but we want to see this. Verse 22, Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Now, Another way to say that, some of the older translations, especially on King James, said have the faith of God. So have the God kind of faith. And one other thing you could do is if you go to um, 1 John, you find out that God is love. So when you see the word God, you can see the word love. And they're sitting here saying, have faith in God or have faith in love, the love of God. Have faith in it to do what he said it would do. Now look at verse 23. For truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. Now, stop right there for a minute. This is the same Jesus that said, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, and he is the one that he said that he was, and I like what C.S. Lewis said, there is no room, there's no wiggle room here. He either is or he isn't. There's no such thing as he's a good teacher, because he's either a liar and a charlatan, or he's God. That's what he said. So he can't be just a good teacher, okay? Get the, make, make sure you square that up in your thinking. He can't just be a good teacher that has great ideas. He's either God or he isn't. Now, what he says to us is, whoever says to this mountain, the word says means speaks. Whoever speaks to this mountain, same as the fig tree. People will tell you that the mountain is figurative. I don't think so. I don't think it is figurative. I think Jesus is using a mountain because he just, just he just knocked a fig tree in the head. And that's physical. That's a that's a an inanimate object. Uh, earlier in Mark chapter four and and Matthew fourteen, he stopped a storm with a word. He just spoke a word and boom, it stopped. He stopped the sea from bellowing around and it was smooth, and calm. He did that with his word. The sea, the ocean, the wind, the, the, the fig tree, those are all physical, inanimate objects. Now, here's what he said. Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. Then in verse 24, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you desire, when you pray... Believe that you will receive them and you'll have them. Now, I didn't say that. This isn't something that I dreamed up on my own. It's when I read this and realized that it applies to me. It applies to my family. It applies to my church. It applies to the churches in this country, the leadership in this country. Therefore, I say, whatever things you ask for or you desire when you pray, believe that you will receive them and you'll have them. So where's the disconnect here? Tell me where the disconnect is. Um, let's go to your average church service. I'm not knocking any church or any specific group of people, but let's just go to your average church service and see uh, how they manage prayer. Okay, let's pray. It's time for prayer. Does anybody have a prayer? This happened to me when I, uh, back in, in uh, my younger days, this happened to me in, in um, a church in Ohio. Uh, They'd have Wednesday night, it was a large church, and on Wednesday night they had prayer time, and they, everybody would sit up in the, in the uh, congregation, and, and it was like a stadium banking, I think. And they'd sit there, and, and they'd, they'd have cards, and they'd pass out cards. A guy would collect them, and they'd come down. There's a guy at a podium that would go through the cards and, and pray for them. And um, this one particular night we were there, and I'd just been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm just learning about God, and uh, this was a church whose denomination wasn't really thrilled with me speaking in tongues, and so at that point, 
uh, there was already a few uh, riffles in the water, you might say. But they come down and they prayed, and here was their prayer. And I, this is this is a summary. It's a pretty good summary of it. Uh, the guy pulls out a card and says that Aunt Minnie is sick. Let's pray for her and see if God will heal her. Oh, Lord, if it be thy will, heal Aunt Minnie. If not, why, well, I guess we just move her on and, you know, we'll collect the insurance and get things cleaned up. And I remember that was the impression that I got of the prayer, and I thought to myself, why would I want this? This is what I had been taught. Uh, I got saved in 1968 in a reform school. And in 1978, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and then I was at this church. And they were upset that I spoke in tongues. They didn't care that alcohol and cigarettes and drugs had been a problem. Uh, they could take the alcohol, the cigarettes, and drugs. They couldn't take the tongues. That, and they actually told me that. But at this point in time, their prayer were along the line of, Lord, if it be your will, heal her. If not, I guess, you know, take her. Now, faith grows where the will of God is known. If you don't know what the will of God is, you can't. your faith can't grow. It can't possibly grow. You can't ask God for something if you don't know what he wants. You can't go to God and talk prayer, basically communion with God. You can't go there if you don't know what he wants. If you don't know what his word says about healing, if you don't know what his word says about uh, your financial situation, if you don't know what his word says about the various aspects of your life, then you're ignorant of the scriptures. And things will happen, and you'll, you'll, get, it, you'll get your wires crossed. You'll blame Satan for what God did, and you'll give God the credit for what Satan does. On and on. You'll just get things backwards if you don't actually know what the Word says. And so, if we go on down here, and he says, in verse 25, When you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven may also forgive your sins. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven Forgive your sins. Now, the, the issue here that we're running into is forgiveness is the foundation that this prayer is built on. If you hold uh, animosity in your heart towards anyone, maybe it's the president, maybe it's the um, uh, your neighbor, maybe it's the school board, I don't know who it might be. It could be your wife, could be your brother, mother, father, sister, I don't know, kid. If you're holding, withholding forgiveness from someone, then your prayers aren't going to work. So we could spend a lot of time talking about forgiveness, but let's just say that if you don't forgive someone, your prayers are, are damaged irreparably. Okay. Now, as we go on and look here, let's go back to verse 23. For I tell you, whoever says to this mountain... now. When I first heard about this teaching, it caught me off guard. It was new wine and old wineskin. I, I was an old wineskin guy, and I said, well, that can't be right. In fact, when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, I had a Bible that was given to me in the 60s by the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. It was a, there was a um, defensive back for the Miami Dolphins. I believe his name was Mark Foley. His name's Foley. I know that. I'd have to go back and look and see. But he was uh, uh, at the, the reform school I was at. He came and, and, and helped lead the football team, a number of people in the football team, myself included, uh, to, a, to a discipleship of Christ. And we got, we got saved. So he gave us, they gave us a Bible. And in that Bible, and back in those days, we didn't have highlighters. So I used colored pens. And I would underline everything in colored pens and if, you, if you'd ever look at one of at my Bible, you can see that I've got all kinds of colors and stuff in it. I've got a, a little code that I use on them. But I didn't have a highlighter. I had them all underlined, this, this, and this. And, and uh, when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I began to understand this teaching, I looked at that Bible, and everything that, uh, that I had underlined said, we don't do this anymore. I had footnotes out there. This is gone. We don't do this. Um, this passed away with the apostles and so forth and so on. And the Holy Spirit was there and convicting me, no, this isn't true. So I, what I ended up doing, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues, knew it was real. 
I got miraculously healed uh, of two afflictions that were just eating me up. And, um, but I knew it was true. So I go home and I look at that Bible and I realize I don't believe this anymore. So I, I actually got rid of the Bible. I just pitched it. I didn't want it. And I went out and got a brand new Bible and I began a new, a new walk with the Lord based on what he said. Now, the one thing that, that the, the gentleman, uh, Larry Roberts, God bless him, uh, he's from Dayton, Ohio. Larry, I hope somehow or another you'd manage to hear this. But uh, one thing he told me is you've got to act on what God says, not what you feel. That's the tough part of this. This is one of the reasons we get in trouble. We've got to act on what God says, not on what we feel. And the other key element is, is, is you've got to believe and have no doubt in your heart. When we go back to Mark chapter 6, let me find this real quick and read chapter 6, verse 5. He could not do any miracles there. It didn't say that he would not. He said he could not do any miracles there except that he laid hands on a few sick folk and healed them. And he was amazed because of their unbelief. You go to the end of the book of Mark. Jesus is getting ready to ascend into heaven. And he's been around for 40 days. And these guys have seen him. And, and just all kinds of things have happened. But listen to this. After he appeared in another form to them, as they walked around in the country, they went and told it to the rest, but they didn't believe them either. Then he goes down and said, Afterward he appeared to the eleven at supper, and he reprimanded them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they didn't believe those who had seen him after he had risen from the dead. You would think before he's going to, you know, here's the guys that have spent all this time with him, you'd think he, he would want to give them a good, encouraging word before he left. No, not necessarily. That's not necessarily what he did. Uh, he waxed them because they didn't believe him. Okay? Now, in this situation, what does it mean to believe? This is where we get into... People have taken this idea in Mark 11. It said, well, I'm, I, I'm confessing I've got a new Mercedes Benz. Nothing wrong with having a new Mercedes Benz. But you've got to go back and look. Do you really believe you're going to get one? Have you really done the, the praying have you really, is this within your wheelhouse, is just something you want, or did the Lord tell you to pray for this, or what? And a lot of people have fallen flat on their faces because they haven't done what God told them to do. And now, in this case, for truly I say to you, whoever says this mountain be removed from the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that he'll have whatever he says. Now, let's look at some other scriptures. Um, Galatians 3.11 says we... we Walk by faith. We live by faith. Um, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says we're saved by grace through faith. Okay? We walk by faith and we not by what we see in this world. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith and not by sight. We fight and win against the enemy by faith. 1 Timothy 6, 12. We fight and win by faith. Let's have the good fight of faith. We overcome the world by faith, 1 John 5, 4. And it's impossible to please God without faith. Unbelief blocks him from our lives. Now you go to Hebrews eleven six, and you can see that he says, in fact, let me just turn there. Let's make sure we're reading that exactly as it says. I don't want to go off of memory because I may be... Remembering it in a different translation, and I might goof it up. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, this is what, chapter 11 is what's called the, the hall of faith. Okay, this is where people of great faith operate. And this is the, the Bible's view of them. Now, it's very interesting that you, if you follow this list and you get down and it says, Abraham, by faith he offered Isaac. And you see, by faith, Moses, when he was born, hidden it, and so forth and so on. You get down to verse 34, a very interesting verse in verse 34. And let's go down and look at that real quick. Um, let's see, let me find it here. 
Actually, let's go back up and we'll start at verse 32 so I can, we can get the whole concept here. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel, and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of the lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weaknesses were made strong, and became valiant in fighting and turned the armies of foreign enemies to flight. So you get this part in verse 34. It quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and out of weakness, out of their weakness, they were made strong. Now, this is in the hall of faith. This is God saying, these are my faith warriors. And look at some of the names in here. Uh, the first one that gets me is uh, Samson. Samson was the, basically the first sex addict we had in the Bible. He was more concerned about get me that woman than he was anything else. And it got him in trouble and it actually ended up getting him killed. And yet, he's in the hall of faith. Now, why would that be? Why would he be in there? Uh, David. Gee, I can't think of anything David might have done wrong in his life. Let me see. Oh, yeah, maybe that thing with Bathsheba was a problem. Uh, that led to a lot of problems for a lot of people. Certainly Uriah, certainly David's son, certainly... Uh, the kingdom, and yet God speaks of him in here as a man of faith. Um, you go down through, and you can find other people in here, and you go down to verse 36. Others had trials of marking, scourging, chains, imprisonment, stone, sawn in two, tempted, slain with the sword. Uh, they wandered around in sheepskin, goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Why would that happen to them? And it says they didn't get. They wandered in deserts and lived in caves. Why would these things happen to people that are believing God? Well, as we studied earlier, uh, we find out, if you get down to, to looking at some of the, the instances in the Old Testament, uh, Job is a good example of that. They didn't know anything about Satan. They knew nothing about him. There was no revelation of Satan in the Old Testament. But Satan was the same in the Old Testament as he was described in the New Testament. Uh, Second Peter, or Peter talks about that and says You're, the, uh, Satan war roars around like a lion looking whom he may desi de desire, looking whom he may devour. Now, um, I say all these things because we want to, we, what we're going to look at and the next time we get together, and we're getting close to our time here, but the next time we get together, we're going to pursue this about words and we're going to go back to Mark 11, 22, and 23. And we want to understand this because this is critical. If you get this right, then you'll find out, geez, this is what we're supposed to be like. If you go read, and I, I told the guys at the classes I teach at Fresh Wind, uh, go read John 14, 15, 16, and 17. And begin to put your name in there. Begin to see that he's talking to you. He's not just talking to his disciples. He's talking to us as individuals. Now, you get in there and you'll find out in, in John chapter 17 that we're supposed to be doing the same things Jesus did. He's commissioned us to do the same things he did. Well, what kind of things did he do? Well, look at John 14, 12, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll attack this. I say attack. We'll dig into this greater. Turn to John 14, 12, and we'll close with this scripture. John 14, 12 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me will do the works that I do also. And he will do greater works than these because I am going to my Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Next time we get together, we're going to explore this because why aren't we doing the things that he did? Why do we not see these things happening in churches? Why do we not see people standing in line to get in churches because of the power of God moving in there? That's our responsibility, and that's what we're going to be looking at the next time we get together. So I look forward to seeing you. Let me close in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for your word. Help us to explore it in deep detail, Father, and show us what you would have us to know about it in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope everybody has a great day. Eu quero ser um